On the morning of the 14th of January 1975, British police were alerted to the kidnapping of 17-year-old heiress Leslie Whittle. She had been abducted from a bedroom during the night and a ransom note had been found. What the police didn't know at the time was that they were already looking for the kidnapper. He was Britain's most wanted man, a notorious armed robber and multiple murderer nicknamed the Black Panther, and unbeknownst to police, he had just taken his first kidnap victim. Born on August 1st, 1936 in the northern town of Bradford, Donald Nielsen was, as we would have said in the north of England, a badden right from the start. By the age of 12, he was already in trouble with police for robbery and vandalism, but due to his young age, he was let off with just a caution. He later joined the army as part of his national service, and it was here that he got his first taste of using firearms. He was married in 1955 to a local girl, Irene Tate, and by the early 1960s, Nielsen was out of the army, but struggling to make ends meet, having had various failed attempts at being a carpenter, builder, and taxi driver. However, one thing he did seem to have a knack for was robbery. Putting some of the skills he'd learned in the army to use, he embarked on a career as a nighttime housebreaker, dressing in dark clothing and sneaking into houses at night whilst the occupants were sleeping. He successfully committed over 400 house robberies without being caught, leading the local police to nickname him the Phantom. Not satisfied with his gains from housebreaking, Nielsen wanted more, and having come across some shotguns and ammunition during one break-in, he decided to up the ante by moving on to armed robbery. His new speciality was knocking off small local post officers. Holding reasonable amounts of cash on the premises, but having little in the way of security, these small, family-run post officers were ideal targets for a man like Nielsen, who was now prepared to use violence to get what he wanted. During the early 1970s, Nielsen is thought to have robbed around 18 village post officers. Wearing his trademark black balaclava, dressed in combat gear and armed with a shotgun, he would enter the bedrooms of the post office owners, terrorising them at gunpoint and forcing them to hand over whatever cash they had on the premises. However, things took a deadly turn in February 1974, when Nielsen killed for the first time. He shot 54-year-old Donald Scapper at point-blank range during a post office robbery in Harrogate, North Yorkshire. Crossing the line into murder seems to have had little effect on Nielsen, as a few months later, he shot and killed postmaster Derek Astin. Astin's wife, Marion, survived the attack and was able to describe to police the man who had attacked them. He prowled at night, he wore black clothing and, in her words, he moved quickly, like a panther. The media caught on to the phrase, and in the morning newspapers, Britain had a new public enemy number one, the Black Panther. Nielsen loved the name he'd been given, and as if to prove how much he deserved his reputation, just a few weeks after killing Astin, he shot and killed postmaster Sidney Grayland and viciously beat his wife Peggy, leaving her alive but with a smashed skull. By now, Nielsen seems to have been convinced of his own prowess as a master criminal, and had decided it was time for the big score. In the newspapers, he had read about the death of George Whittle, a British transport tycoon, who had left his entire fortune and business to his wife and two children. Nielsen felt sure that if he kidnapped the widow, the family would agree to a ransom demand of £50,000. In today's money, that equates to around £450,000, or just over half a million US dollars. In preparation for the kidnapping, Nielsen rented a garage where he housed a stolen car with false number plates. He bought night sights, binoculars, duct tape and lengths of coiled wire, a sleeping bag and some flashlights. He scouted out the Whittles' home in Shropshire and built up his own physical stamina by running around Bradford wearing a heavy backpack. He settled on Bathpool Park Reservoir in Staffordshire as the site where he would keep his victim and collect the ransom. He figured that the labyrinth of underground passages beneath the pumping stations would allow him to evade capture in the event that the police were watching the ransom drop. 
In the early hours of the morning of January the 14th, 1975, Nielsen broke into the Whittles' home. But instead of finding George Whittle's widow, he came across 17-year-old Leslie Whittle, the petite college student daughter. Nielsen immediately changed his plan for abducting Mrs. Whittle and went straight for Leslie instead, forcing her at gunpoint to dress in a nightgown and then tying her up and gagging her. Nielsen slung Leslie over his shoulder, exited the house and made off into the night, heading for the Bathpool Park Reservoir. Once there, he forced Leslie through a small hatch and down a 60-foot access shaft where she was secured on a small platform. She was stripped naked, her wrists bound, and a wire noose was put around her neck, securing her to the ladder. Her only comforts on the small metal ledge were a sleeping bag and a flashlight. Nielsen went back up the shaft and locked her in, leaving the terrified young girl perched on the small platform, cold, alone, hands bound, with a hangman's hood and noose around her neck. A ransom note printed on dino tape was left behind at the Whittle house and was found the following morning. The police were called in, but having had no previous experience of dealing with a kidnap situation, they weren't sure how to proceed, and they thought at first it was probably just a student prank. Despite a supposed news blackout, the newspapers quickly got a hold of the story, and it became front page news. A huge manhunt for Leslie was started, even though Nielsen had said in his ransom note, if tricks or police, dead. Now began a series of bungled attempts to collect the ransom. The first ransom note stated that Leslie's older brother, Ronald, should go to a local shopping centre and wait for a phone call at a public telephone. But Nielsen was late in making the call, and the shopping centre had already closed. The next day, Nielsen got Leslie to record a message on a cassette player, which he played down the telephone, instructing Ronald to bring a suitcase with the money to a telephone box, where he would be given further instructions. At 11.30pm, Ronald arrived at the phone box, found the message telling him to drive to Bathpool Park Reservoir, where he would be signalled with a flashing light. Now things started to go awry in rapid succession. Firstly, while Nielsen was checking the trail for his getaway, he was surprised by 44-year-old night watchman Gerald Smith. Nielsen shot him six times, but amazingly, Smith survived. Next, Ronald Whittle, being unfamiliar with the area around Bathpool Park Reservoir, had gotten hopelessly lost, and was now over two hours late. Meanwhile, a car had pulled up at the ransom drop and stopped. Nielsen, who was hiding in the bushes, started flashing his light at the car, but it was just a courting couple. They honked the horn and quickly drove off. As if this wasn't enough to set Nielsen on edge, a few minutes later a police car pulled up and a policeman got out. Now this was just pure bad luck. The Bobby had only stopped for a cigarette break and he had no idea about the ransom drop or kidnap. But this coincidence was too much for Nielsen. He aborted his plan and fled. Some time later, Ronald finally arrived with the money. He shouted, flashed his car lights, but received no response. There was no sign of the Black Panther or of his sister, Leslie. For the police, the trail now went cold. The next day, police officers searched Bathwell Park, but failed to find any clues, even though members of the public would later find evidence left behind. On the tape recording that Leslie had made, running water could be heard in the background and her voice sounded echoey, but no one thought to check the tunnels and shafts beneath the reservoir. Some kids that were playing in the park found a flashlight and a bit of the dino tape that had a message on it saying, drop suitcase into hole, and another passerby had found Nielsen's gloves which were lying in the grass, but nobody seemed to put any of the clues together and Leslie remained missing. One vital piece of evidence was located, though. The stolen car, which Nielsen had used, was found abandoned close to the site where the night watchman, Gerald Smith, had been shot. When police searched the car, they found Leslie's slippers, a cassette with Leslie's voice on it, rope and wire. They also found fingerprints, which confirmed something surprising. They matched the prints of the notorious Black Panther. The kidnapper and the post office killer were one in the same. The police were under incredible public pressure to catch the Black Panther. 
This was a case that would make and break the careers of senior detectives, but the killer seemed to have just vanished into thin air. Eventually, almost two months after the kidnapping and the bungled ransom drop, a full search of the area around Bathpool Park was made and, on March 7th, the body of Leslie Whittle was found at the bottom of the 60-foot shaft. She was hanging by her neck with her feet dangling just six inches from the floor. She'd either fallen or been pushed off the ledge by Nielsen and had died of shock as the wire noose had throttled her. She was naked and emaciated. Her body weighed only 44 kilograms. Leslie's body was recovered and her grieving family were able to bury her. Nielsen, however, remained at large for another nine months, but his luck finally ran out in December 1975. Two police officers, Tony White and Stuart McKenzie, had noticed a man acting suspiciously, and when they asked him to come over, he whipped out a sawn-off shotgun from his bag and forced the two police officers back into the patrol car. Nielsen ordered them to drive towards Sherwood Forest, where he intended to execute them. Quick thinking by McKenzie, pretending not to know the way, gave White his chance to grab the gun. There was a struggle, the gun went off, blowing a hole through the roof of the car, and they skidded to a halt, crashing into the curb outside a fish and chip shop. Locals waiting outside the shop ran to the policeman's aid, dragging Nielsen down and giving him a thorough beating. The officers dragged the dazed Nielsen away from the crowd and handcuffed him to some nearby railings. By sheer fluke, they had just caught the infamous Black Panther, and his reign of terror was over. Fingerprints confirmed his identity, and a search of Nielsen's house produced all the evidence needed to confirm that he was indeed the Black Panther. Amongst all the incriminating evidence was a statue of a Black Panther, which was one of Nielsen's prized possessions. At the trial, he was convicted and given four whole life sentences for the four murders he'd committed and he was told that he would never leave prison. Nielsen appealed his conviction in 2008, hoping that the EU human rights laws would allow his release, but this bid failed and he remained incarcerated. He later developed motor neurone disease and he died in 2011 at the age of 75, still in prison. He is one of only a select few prisoners in the UK to have never been released. Strangely, Nielsen never admitted to murdering Leslie Whittle, although he admitted freely to all his other crimes. He always maintained that it was an accident and that she had unintentionally slipped off the ledge. His defence lawyers argued that the wire noose was long enough to reach the floor below and were for it not snagging on a stanchion in the shaft that Leslie would have actually landed on the floor. Although convicted in court of her murder, Nielsen always pled his innocence right up until his death. Regardless of this, assuming Nielsen didn't push her but simply just left her down in the shaft alone and without provisions, the trauma and the pain which she must have undergone whilst trapped in her underground dungeon is enough for most people to agree that the Black Panther should have indeed remained caged forever. <laughs>